Thanks very much for that uh, wonderful introduction. So um, I will be talking about the unreasonable effectiveness of physics and mathematics, though not quite as many branches of mathematics as were, was alluded to a minute ago. Um, and I want to start by saying that uh, my title is a bit of a twist on um, a famous essay by the physicist Eugene Wigner, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. And the latter is something we're a little bit more familiar with. Um, from high school, we're used to solving simple equations or using basic concepts from geometry in order to solve problems of interest in physics or other natural sciences. But today, I'd like to tell you about um, the field in which I work, which uh, really has new developments going in the opposite direction. And so I'd like to argue that modern physics really has a lot to say about mathematics. And um, I believe that this is a really fruitful uh, area of interdisciplinary research. And uh, I think the spirit of this field is really well summarized by this quote by Raoul Bott, who was um, a late mathematician at Harvard. And uh, he says that although physicists and mathematicians, you know, we really have different sets of tools, we speak different languages sometimes, um, there's a push and pull nature of our relationship that really invigorates both of our fields and uh, makes both, both fields stronger for the interaction. And so I'll be telling you um, one story from this interaction coming from my perspective as a theoretical physicist. And in particular, the theory that I work on is called string theory. So let me briefly give you the basic picture of what string theory is. So as the name suggests, string theory is a theory of little vibrating one-dimensional objects strings, and okay, this sounds a little bit innocuous, why would I care about a theory like this? And it turns out that string theory is what's called a theory of quantum gravity. So what do I mean by that? Well, there are two great pillars of modern physics, uh, at least two that I'm going to talk about right now, and uh, one is general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity. And that's a theory that talks about large scale structures. What is the shape of space time? You know, how do we understand galaxies, planets, large objects? I mean, even just today, we had a really exciting announcement that gravitational waves were discovered. That's the theory of general relativity, or one of its predictions. And on the other hand, we have the theory of quantum mechanics, which is a really beautiful and extraordinarily effective theory for describing things that are very small. Molecules, atoms, elementary particles, so, and so forth. And the quantum theory of gravity really seeks to unite these two great pillars. And this is an old dream called unification, starting with Einstein that we have two great theories, but why can't we combine them into one great theory that incorporates aspects of both? And this was a notoriously hard problem. And it wasn't until the 1970s when physicists were studying actually something totally different than nuclear force in atoms that they discovered this theory of strings. And after looking at it a little bit more carefully, what they found was that this very consistent quantum mechanical theory actually had gravity within it. They found that Einstein's equations emerged from equations coming from this quantum mechanical theory of strings. And I don't have time to tell you too much more about string theory. It might be the theory of quantum gravity that describes our universe. But today, I'll be telling you about its um, role as a powerful and beautiful machine in generating interesting questions in mathematics. Um, and to that end, I'll only tell you one of string theory's predictions, perhaps one of its more well-known ones. And if you play with the equations of string theory, they tell you something a little bit strange. They say that there should be 10 space-time dimensions. What do I mean by that? Well, in our daily life, we're used to three spatial dimensions, forward, back, left, right, up, and down. And we're also used to things moving in time or evolving in time. And Einstein's theory of relativity has taught us that we should think of space and time on the same footing. So I say that we're used to four large macroscopic space-time dimensions. We're used to four. But string theory tells us that maybe there's 10. And if there are 10, where are they? And why don't we see them? And what are their implications for physics? And so first, let's pretend that string theory just predicted one additional dimension that we don't see. Well, how should I think about it? So imagine you're standing very far away from a telephone wire. If you're far enough away, you only see one dimension that the wire has, its length. But if you zoomed in closer to the wire, or if you were a little insect that could crawl around on the surface of the wire, you'd become cognizant of the other dimension it has, the width the small circular extra dimension that you might not have been aware of if you were standing very far away. And so perhaps if there was one extra space-time dimension, it would be curled up very small in a little circle. This is an idea dating back to the physicists Kaluza and Klein. And um, 
you know, we don't see the circular dimension. Perhaps it's very small. And perhaps someday experiments will tell us whether or not it's actually there. But we need experiments that can really zoom in close enough, so to speak, that would elucidate the structure of space-time for us. But now, string theory says that there are 10 space-time dimensions, and if we believe it, they should be curled up into much more elaborate shapes or geometries than circles. And so I've pictured here some of the candidate shapes that string theory says are candidates for the extra six dimensions. And these beautiful geometries have a very fancy name. They're called Calabi-Yau manifolds, after the mathematicians Calabi and Yau, who really advanced their studies in mathematics. And these fancy um, extra dimensions, rather uh, poorly rendered here in only two dimensions, um, they were certainly of independent interest to mathematicians, but also one should note that if these really are the extra six dimensions of space-time, if we're interested in studying string theory and figuring out what its predictions are, then the geometry of these calabi manifolds should tell us something about physics. So in particular, if we're studying interactions of particles in the four macroscopic dimensions, well, the predictions that we see in four dimensions should be influenced by the geometry of these interesting and beautiful structures that might be hiding, curled up, very small. And so the story I'd like to tell you about string theory impacting mathematics, I like to call making string theory count, quite literally, because the branch of math that I'll be telling you about is called enumerative geometry, which is counting numbers of solutions to certain geometric questions. And this is an old and venerable subject in mathematics, so to orient you, let me tell you an example of such question in enumerative geometry from around 200 BC. And the question is, how many circles are tangent to three given circles in a plane? And by tangent, I mean it just touches each of the three circles at one point. And here's one pictorial solution to the problem. You can see that the black circles are our fixed circles in the plane, and this purplish circle is tangent to them. It touches them once at each point. And the answer to the enumerative geometry question, as it turns out, is that in general there are eight such solutions. And you can even come up with that by spending a lot of time drawing circles on paper. You don't really need too much uh, fancy intuition to tell you the answer to this enumerative geometry question. But if I'm a modern mathematician, maybe drawing circles on paper isn't quite enough for me. Maybe I'm interested in calabi manifolds, these strange geometric structures. And here I've just pictured one very beautiful and simple, perhaps the most simple example of a calabi manifold. It's called the quintic. And if you're an equations person, you can see that it's called that because it's an equation in five variables and the raised to the fifth power. So the number five shows up a lot. And so this, because it's a calabi manifold, it's a candidate manifold on which strings might live. But mathematicians don't necessarily care about string theory, at least not yet, and they were just asking the following question. Can we count the number of lines in a quintic? Or a line is, equa is an equation of degree one. I'll explain that in a minute. And more generally, what about the number of curves of degree d? I'll call this number n sub d. So here I've just pictured some example curves. You can see the line is an uh, a curve of degree one. And if you don't like equations, you can just trust me that equations have a number associated to them called the degree. And each of these curves that are drawn have some equation that's describing them. And these are just some examples of such curves. Actually, it's not a complete um, uh, set of pictures by any means. The number of different curves really proliferates as you increase the degree. But, um, and if you don't like equations, just think of curves of higher d having more wiggles and loops and more elaborate things going on. They're just more complicated looking. Um, and if you like equations, I'll tell you that uh, the curves are described by polynomials in degree d. That's why they're called that. And so it's a natural question for mathematicians how many such curves can live on this fancy manifold that you're interested in? This is certainly not a question you can attack by drawing a lot of pictures on a piece of paper. Maybe not even if you had a six-dimensional paper lying around. And so mathematicians worked very hard to try and answer this question. They used the height of the geometric abstract tools that they had at the time. They used all their grad students, you know, every tool at their disposal. And after all of this work, I think they got to maybe only n sub three. And I think n sub three even had a mistake in it, so they didn't get very far. It was very hard, I mean, an extremely difficult problem. But on the other end of the campus, or a few buildings away, physicists were studying string theory. And string theory had these manifolds hiding very quietly in the structure of space-time. And the physicists were asking, you know, perhaps more normal physics questions. What are the, how do particles interact? You know, how strongly do they interact? What's the nature of the particles in the four space-time dimensions? But 
as you can imagine, the strings are moving around. You know, they're probing the geometry of space-time. They're traveling around on these kalabi yau manifolds. And in fact, strings as little one-dimensional objects are wiggling around and they look like curves crawling all over the surface of these manifolds, uh, these geometries, if you will. And so the physicists had some answer to some physical questions and they found some numbers hidden in their answers, some large, interesting-looking integers. So they went to their mathematician friends. Well, is the physics telling us anything interesting about the geometry? And the mathematician said, well, you know, we've been computing these curve counts and we've got to n sub three, and you know, it's pretty hard, we think we're right. And the physicist said, oh, I see. Well, I think we can do a little better with string theory. And in fact, it turned out that string theory can count these curves naturally, just based on the strings moving around in these spaces. String theory generated an infinite number of predictions. And mathematicians later worked hard and were able to prove this. And these numbers I've shown you, I just computed for the quintic, but um, this is true for more general kalabi geometries that might live in string theory. Moreover, not only is this conjecture proved, but new ingredients and ideas from string theory, following up on this observation, led to the development of a whole new subject in geometry. It's called mirror symmetry, unfortunately not as simple as its name suggests. It's a very active area of mathematical research today, um, going on even now. And what I really want to stress is that this is just one success story of string theory influencing mathematics. In fact, we're still only scratching the surface of this incredible edifice that's string theory, an incredible and beautiful theoretical structure. My research, um, as was mentioned briefly, tries to bring together a lot of areas of mathematics in new, interesting, unifying ways. And I think we're making many discoveries the, um, such that physics is really helping mathematics develop, and I think mathematics is, of course, still teaching us a great deal about physics. And um, I thank you for your attention.